You know, through the years since Jesus died on the cross, the cross has become really the symbol of the Christian faith. And the cross is where Jesus, you know, paid the ultimate sacrifice and penalty for all of our sin. The, the cross is where Jesus died. And I want you to just let that sink in for a moment because there are some that say, well, Jesus didn't really die. He just kind of passed out. No, you don't put people who pass out in tombs. Jesus literally died. And then Jesus was buried. And so when we take the elements of the Lord's Supper, we remember that Jesus died. His body was broken. His blood was poured out for us. We remember that. But here's the question. What if the story of Jesus ended there? What if the story of Jesus ended in the tomb? If you have your Bible, I want you to find 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you don't have your Bible today, the Scriptures will be on the screen and you can follow along. But Paul is writing to some people, and I think that maybe the people that Paul is writing to, they actually might be very similar to you. And so Paul writes to them in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 15, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel which I preach to you. Now that word gospel, if you've been around church at all, that word means good news. And you hear guys say it, you, know, you have to believe the gospel. The gospel, it just simply means good news that has been proclaimed. So Paul reminds these Christians, he says, I want to remind you of the good news that I preach to you. And then he continues, which you received and in which you stand. And by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according with the Scriptures, and that He was buried and He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Christianity, the message of Jesus, is good news. And so before we go on with the rest of the day, I, I just want to say something here. If when you think of Jesus, it is anything but good news, I want to apologize to you. I want to apologize to you because someone who probably named the name of Christ messed up the image of Jesus. The Gospel is good news. But for so many people in our culture, the whole idea of Jesus and the church and God, it's not good news. And maybe it's not good news because you knew a, a hypocritical Christian. You know, that said they live one way at church on Sunday, but then they lived another way at home. Or, or maybe your experience with Jesus has been that you entered into a church and it was nothing but judgmental stares. Maybe they didn't think your skirt was long enough. Or maybe, maybe they didn't think you were kind of holy enough. Or, or maybe it's just someone who treated you poorly and someone who said that they were a follower of Jesus, but, but they hurt you deeply. And because of that, your image of Jesus is anything but good news. And maybe you've walked out on the church. Maybe you've walked out on Jesus. And if that's you, I want to apologize to you. Because Jesus and His death and His resurrection, it is good news. And it is good news for everyone. And I'm sorry if someone messed that up with, with you. But Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, reminds these, these followers of Christ in Corinth, he reminds them that the Gospel which he received he imparted to them, and they had believed it, and He said to them, it is good news. And this is the good news, that Jesus died, He was buried, and He rose again. Now, Corinth was a Greek city. And in this Greek culture, the idea of the resurrection was ridiculous. And let's just be honest. Isn't the idea of someone coming back from the dead completely ridiculous? I mean, have you ever gone to a funeral and thought, today might be the day they get up out of the casket? No. Because dead is dead. And so for the Greeks, the idea of a resurrection of the dead was just, it was just stupid. It was just crazy for anyone to claim that. Paul in Athens, which had a very similar culture to Corinth, in Acts chapter 17 says that when he was preaching the resurrection of the dead, that some people mocked it. Corinth is the United States. 
Corinth is your family. Corinth is our community and increasingly our culture. The idea that Jesus rose from the dead is ridiculous. In 2006, that's 10 years ago, doesn't that seem crazy? Like you remember Y2K, how scared you were that everything's going to, you know, your computer was going to burn and all that stuff? I mean, that's 16 years ago. It's just wild. A study done in 2006, they asked a question. This was done by Scripps Howard and Ohio State University. They, they sampled thousands of, of Americans. They asked this question. Do you believe that after, your di- after you die, your physical body will be resurrected someday? Now, I'm not going to ask you for a show of hands. But how many of you believe that after, you're, after you die, your physical body will one day be resurrected? So 36% said yes. 54% answered no. And 10% are probably like most of us, I don't know. I'm undecided about that. I'm going to decide later when I die. Over the half, half of the people that you encounter on a daily basis, they do not believe in the physical resurrection. Half. So, I don't know how many are represented in here, but maybe you're exactly like the people in Corinth. To preach that Jesus rose from the grave is absolutely preposterous. Even the most skeptical people believe some facts about Jesus. Most historians, Christians or, Christian or not, believe that Jesus lived. And that He made most of His time in, in, in the Jerusalem, in Cana, in Galilee, all those areas, Judea. He lived, and, and, he was, and during that time, there was Roman government that was overseeing everything. They, they believe those historical facts about Jesus. And even secular historians believe that Jesus made claims about Himself. That He claimed to be God. That He claimed that when He died, He would rise again. So even people that are skeptical and non-believers, they believe certain facts about Jesus. And, but many stay there. They, they stay at the claim. Yeah, Jesus lived and He was a historical figure. And we know that Jesus died. Historically, He died by crucifixion at the hands of the Romans. But for many people, it stays there. So what if the Christian message ended at the first part of verse 4? Here's the Gospel. That Jesus died for your sins according to the Scriptures and was buried. And that's the end. What does that mean for you? Let me ask it in this way. If Christ has not been raised, then fill in the blank. I want you to give some thought to that for a minute. If Christ has not been raised, what does that mean? What if the cross and the tomb are the end of the story? What if there is no Sunday? What if there is no resurrection? Well, then we would fill in that blank by saying something like this. If Christ has not been raised, then the entire Bible is a lie. If Jesus Christ wasn't raised from the dead, then Christianity is false. If Jesus has not been raised, there's no point in you being here today. Why would you be here if Jesus did not come back from the dead? In fact, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then Jesus is no different than any other man who has ever lived. And He's no different from any religious figure that's ever lived. Muhammad died. Joseph Stalin died. Siddhartha Gautama, the, the founder of Buddhism, he died. Joseph Smith, he died. Abraham, the father of the Jewish faith, he died. Jesus died. Okay? Just like everyone else. If there is no resurrection, if Christ has not been raised, then what? Well, let's look at verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 15. Paul goes on to say, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can, you some, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised then our preaching is in vain and your faith is useless. Worthless. A piece of garbage. Those are pretty powerful words. Paul fills in the blank, first of all, in verse 14. He says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Now, now Paul, had, when he met Jesus, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, after Paul met Jesus, his life radically changed, and he began to go all around the world and preach about Jesus. Much of the New Testament is about his story, 
going to all the, all the corners of the earth trying to proclaim that Jesus died. So if Paul is saying, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Does that mean all of it? Does that mean that when Paul preached that Jesus was God in the flesh, that that preaching is empty? Yes. Does that mean that when Paul preached that Jesus is the only hope for sinners, that's useless? Yes. Does that mean if Jesus hasn't been raised, when, when Paul preached that there is no other God likened to Jesus, that that is useless? Yes. Does that mean that when Paul said that Jesus was God in the flesh, that he preached that Jesus created everything that was, if Jesus didn't rise from the grave, then that preaching is in vain? Yes. And that means that every sermon I've ever preached has been in vain. And that means that every person who's ever told anybody about Jesus, that proclamation is vain, it's useless, it's garbage, it's trash, if Jesus didn't come back from the dead. So the next thing that Paul says in verse 14, it's very clear. If the gospel that Paul preached that they believed is vain, Paul says in verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is vain. Your faith is is useless. Paul said in verse 1, I preached the gospel to you and you received it by faith. You believe what I said. How that Christ died, was buried, and rose again and, and you believed it. But if that preaching you believed is worthless, then your faith is also worthless. He says in verse 14, if Jesus was not raised, then your faith is in vain. How many of you saw the movie Titanic? We're all going to date ourselves here. All right, all the young people are like, what's that? All right, the Titanic, you remember the scene when the Titanic hits the iceberg and there's some guy sitting in one of the, you know, areas and, and so the, the engineer of the ship is explaining to people the ship is going to sink. I mean, it, it's going down. And one guy is sitting there and he's got his, I don't know what they call it, he had his tux on, he had this little shawl over and he's like, the Titanic can't sink. And, and the designer, engineer, he says, oh, I assure you, it can sink. And it's going to sink. And that man, the, the legend of that man's death is that he refused to put on a life jacket. Because he believed that even though everything else was saying something else, the Titanic wouldn't sink. And he perished in the ocean that night. His faith in the Titanic was worthless. And Paul says if Jesus did not rise from the dead, you're no different than him. To stand and say, you know, my only hope for heaven is Jesus. Look, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, it's ignorance for you to say that. It's foolishness to say those kind of words. He says in verse 17, look at this. And if Christ has, been not, has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. That word futile or futile means to be devoid of truth. So this morning, on the way to church... My children always test my walk with Jesus. There are three things that I've experienced in my life that will test my walk with Jesus unlike any other. You want them? Number one, golf. Number two, pulling the cord on a weed eater. Yesterday, we about had to come to Jesus meeting. I was about to Ken come in and break that thing over my knee. And the third one is my children on Sunday mornings. So I got out of the car for a minute, you know, gave the eggs so we can pass them out and all that. And I get back in and Ellie says, Adam told me shut up. So, you know, now I have to, you know, I have to play Judge Judy. Adam, don't tell me, tell me it's raining, you're peeing on my leg. Like Judge Judy, right? Okay, Adam, did you tell Ellie to shut up? No. Okay, Adam, look at me in my eyes. Did you tell Ellie to shut up? No, I didn't say that. She said that. And then Ellie, we've only had her six months. She already knows this whole sibling. Oh, no, you're not going to put that on me, baby. She's like, I didn't say it. I didn't say it. Back and forth, back and forth. Looking at Adam, I'm like, I know he's lying. <laughs> Completely devoid of truth. You can stand here and tell me all day long that you didn't tell her that, but I know in my heart you said it. And his statement to me that he didn't say it is about as worthless as your faith if Jesus didn't rise from the grave. If Jesus had not been raised, then your faith is vain. But notice also what Paul says in verse 17. And this is mind-blowing to me. 
If Jesus is not raised, then you are still in your sins. Wait a second. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, right? And and when Jesus died on the cross, He said, it is finished. So the payment for my sin was made. And Paul says, yes, the payment for your sin is made, but if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, your sins are not forgiven. The good news is incomplete without the resurrection of Jesus. You are still in your sins if Jesus did not rise from the grave. So who saw Superman versus Batman this weekend? Don't give me any spoilers. Okay, What's Superman's arch enemy? Not people, but the object. Kryptonite, right? He gets around it and you know, he can't, I don't know why that is, but I don't, I'm not a comic book person. So, when I, Years ago, I went on my first camping trip in Arkansas. Don't do your suey calls and all that stuff. You know, it's weird. <clears throat> and I was a little freaked out because the park we went to had black bears in it. So I had a friend of mine that said, hey, I want to give you a book, and it, it's called When Bears Attack. He's like, just, just so you'll be aware of how bad it's going to be for you if that bear attacks you. And it's like story after story, and, and all the stories were the same. We think this is what happened based on the claw marks. And I, mean, I read it, I'm like, I'm never leaving this house. You know, I know black bears aren't here, but I, I fear them immensely. So when I was going, I'm not kidding you, man, we were in our tent that night, and any, any twig out there, you know, I'm wanting to pull the shotgun out. You know, like, get away, bear! You know, or throw my friend toward him, whatever it would take, you know? So I have a, I'm very fearful of bears because I'm, I'm going to lose against the grizzly bear regardless of what the revenant says. The second one is heights. And I tell people all the time, I'm not scared of heights. I'm scared of falling from heights. Like, it's not a big deal that this ceiling is high, but if I'm on top of it and fall off, I'm scared of that. Call me crazy, but I'm probably not going to live. But our greatest enemy are not bears or car accidents or roller coasters or heights or anything that you might be fearful of, the things that we fear the most are the things that will take our life because our greatest enemy is death. At the end of a grizzly bear attack, that's what's waiting. When you fall from a height, that's what's waiting for you. The greatest enemy of man is death. And if Jesus did not rise from the grave, then our greatest enemy has not been overcome. Yeah, Jesus paid for your sins on the cross, but if He didn't come back from the grave, still face the wages of sin is death. And that's it. It's final. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all had sinned. Every person in this room one day is going to die. It's going to happen. No one can avoid that. You can't escape it. But if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then beyond that moment, there is no hope for you. There's nothing. If Jesus was merely a man who succumbed to the greatest enemy of man, then we suffer the wages of sin. Paul says, are still in our sins. But the resurrection proves that what Jesus did on the cross was sufficient to pay for our sins. But without the resurrection, we're still in our sin. He goes on to say in verse 18, Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, only we are of all people most to be pitied. If Christ has not been raised, then we are hopeless. If Christ has not been raised, then the Gospel that we preach is in vain. And if Christ has not been raised, then the Gospel that you believed can't save you. If Jesus has not been raised, you're still in your sins. Do you see it? And if Christ has not been raised, then every funeral is the end of anything good. Because every person dies in their sins. That word pitied, it means to be miserable. If Jesus has not been raised, then evil will prevail. If Jesus has not been raised, then sin has dominion forever. If Jesus has not been raised, there is no justice. There is no righting of the wrong of terror attacks. If Jesus has not been raised, there is no hope. And every phone call that I receive about a person that passes away, if Jesus has not been raised, then I have to stand up at the funeral home or at the church and say, this is it, that was as good as it's going to get because this person died in their sins. There is no hope beyond the grave if Jesus had not been raised. 
But here's a different question. What if Christ has been raised? What if Christ has been raised? What if the cross and the tomb aren't the end? What if there was a resurrection? What if Jesus Christ did rise from the grave? Then our preaching is meaningful and true. If Jesus rose from the grave, then your faith is secure. If Jesus rose from the grave, then your sins have been forgiven because of your faith in Jesus. And if Jesus rose from the grave, then hope lives. We're not hopeless. But look in verse 20, and I want you to, want you to notice the transition that Paul makes. After all these hypotheticals, if Jesus didn't raise, then this. If Jesus has not been raised, then this. Look at verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The, res- the resurrection of Jesus is not an if it happened kind of event. Paul said it in fact happened. But because Jesus in fact has risen from the dead. After his resurrection, if you look back to verse 5, Jesus appeared in his resurrected body to Peter. In verse 5, he also appeared to the 12 disciples. Then in verse 6, he appeared to 500 brothers in Jerusalem. In verse 7, he appeared to James and the apostles. In verse 8, Paul says, not only did he appear to all them, but I saw him myself. I was an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus. And many of those people that claimed to see the resurrected Christ gave their lives, not because of what someone else told them about Jesus, but because of what they were telling people about Jesus. They knew that Jesus had in fact risen from the dead. So because... Christ has been raised from the dead. Then in verse 20, we have hope. In verse 22, we have life. And I want you to look at verse 25 and 26 and listen to the beautiful words. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is what? Death. I got a text yesterday from a friend of mine that's been a friend for years. And I went up and visited her and her mom last Wednesday night. Her mom was in hospice care, and I knew then it was just a matter of a couple of days. And she texted me the simple words, we lost mom early this morning. And my response to her was, I'm so sorry for your loss, but I am so thankful for the hope that we have in Jesus. This is not the end for her. When she breathed her last breath on this earth, The Bible teaches clearly that she was ushered into the presence of God. And you know why? Because Christ, in fact, has risen from the dead. It's it's not up for debate. It doesn't matter what your opinion is. It doesn't matter how many people say it didn't happen. I have been to Jerusalem. I have walked into the tomb. And His body is not there. And those disciples, by their own admission, were hiding for fear of the Jews when Jesus was resurrected. They had just seen Jesus crucified. There was no way they were going to go to that tomb and overpower those Roman soldiers to their own death to bring Jesus out of the, out of the grave to resurrect some lie that they would want to purport upon all the people. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It is a fact. And because of that, we have hope. Because of that, our faith is secure. Because of that, we have hope. Life. I love verse 55 through 57. And I've read this passage so many times at funerals. Paul says this in verse 55 Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What did Jesus give us victory over? He gave us victory over our greatest enemy, death, that came as a result of our sin. And He gave us that victory because Jesus rose from the grave. So because Christ has been raised from the dead, then I will tell you, That He is my hope. And I trust in Jesus completely. I'm going to heaven one day not because I'm a good person or a good pastor. I'm going to heaven because Jesus died for me.
and he was buried, and he rose again. And because he has been raised, I serve him, not as just my Savior, but he is the Lord of my life. Because verse 58 is important, and I'll end here. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Because Christ has been raised from the dead, then I give him my life. Let me tell you something. Because Jesus rose from the grave, he deserves more than one Sunday a year. Because Jesus rose from the grave, he deserves more than one day a week. Because Jesus rose from the grave, he deserves my life. Because it's in him that I move and I live and I have my being. The cross is a beautiful symbol. It is the symbol of the suffering that Jesus endured for our sins. But the hope of the Christian faith doesn't end in the tomb. It ends on that first day of the week when those women came to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus, expecting that dead body to be there, and being met with the message, He is not here, for He has risen. Period. He is risen. So two challenges for you today. Number one, maybe this is the first time that you've really considered Jesus and the fact that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again for you. Your only hope for heaven is Jesus. It's not a church. It's not a baptism. It's not a prayer. It's not giving money. It's not being a good neighbor. It's not any of those things. Your hope for heaven is Jesus and Jesus alone. When you stand before Jesus, when you stand before God and His perfection, all of your good works will not be enough to erase one sin, but the one work that Jesus did on the cross for you was enough to pay for all of it. And all you have to do in your heart is believe it. That's it. Just believe it. And then... As a child of God, make Him. Make Him the Lord of your life. I don't want to see some of you next year. I want to see you next week. Jesus deserves our lives. So I want to encourage you to give your life to Him. Let's stand together and pray.